uh, one hour lecture on electronic transport in general. So my idea is that I'll give you s some introduction so that um, the lectures that will give you uh, research talks, uh, you can actually understand, or hopefully what they will do is they can remove part of their introduction to explain electronic transport and they can focus more on the um, on their own work, so I don't, uh, that's, that's basically the idea. So hopefully what I'll do here is that you can have some background uh, to understand uh, electronic transport in general. So I'll start from the very basic until uh, the, the very last lecture where I'll try to do something more quantitative and also try to introduce a little bit of what we're doing. So I'm at the Institute of Theoretical Physics, which is at uh, UNESP in uh, Sao Paulo, so we're based in the city of Sao Paulo. It's a small institute, only about 20 people. Uh, but currently, I am uh, doing some work at uh, the chemical engineering department at MIT. So I'm on a sabbatical. So they, they flew me all the way from Boston to be here, which I can't complain because it's actually quite cold there right now. It's, it's definitely going to get colder, but uh, that's, that's uh, the idea. So, okay, so... Um, I'll give you a little bit of a motivation of why I think you should watch these uh, next three lectures. Um, it's nine o'clock in the morning, so we should all be up. It's not after lunch. Um, but besides all the scientific part, uh, some random place in the lecture, I'll put a lot of advertising about jobs that will be coming up uh, at the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Brazil. So if you're looking for a job, that's another reason for watching the lectures. And I will not put it in the beginning or in the end so that you will be in some random place so that you have to pay attention. Uh, okay, so you've probably seen this in, a, in a some form or other. Uh, mine is quite old, actually, it's only 2015. So the basic idea is that uh, we're decreasing the size of devices, depending on you're thinking about electronic devices, uh, like computers, or we're thinking about um, uh, uh, reading technology, read-writing technology in, in uh, hard drives. There is some form of, of Moore's Law, which says that the size or the number of devices, in our case transistors, is decreasing. So basically what we want to do is to process more information uh, uh, every time. And one possibility to do this is to actually increase the number of devices that you put in a in a single uh, processing unit. And uh, it's quite amazing that we've been doing this for the last uh, uh, 40 to 50 years by actually doubling the speed at which we can perform a specific calculation uh, by doing so. So um, we want to keep this. And what, what is happening is that we've been foreseeing the end of what we call the silicon technology for the last 40 years. So we've been saying, oh, you know, the end of silicon technology, or we can't really shrink our transistors any longer. Um, it, we've been always proven wrong, which you can think that is a good thing or a bad thing. But uh, really what we're talking about is that perhaps we need to make a change from, you know, the typical transistor shape or the transistor material to something slightly different. What is quite clear is that we are reaching a, a situation where things are become clearly nanoscopic. Right, so this is a, a picture of, uh, of what we have now inside in a transistor. So a typical transistor is you have a source, you have a drain, you have a channel, um, and then you have a gate, uh, which is metallic, and then you have an oxide that uh, shields this gate so that you cannot really have any form of, of current leakage between these two. And in actual fact, I mean, there has been changes in this, uh, in this design, or at least in the materials. For example, now you don't actually have a silicon oxide, uh, simple sing silicon oxide um, gate anymore. What you have is you dope it with a, a high K material, in this case hafnium, um, to actually imp improve the performance, or you can make these things smaller and smaller and still have no leakage between your source and your, and your gate. So clearly we've reached uh, the nanoscopic regime. Uh, this means that um, what we're going to see is that current flowing through these devices is going to be fundamentally different. And so we need to think, or at least we need to go down to a theory that describes this 
uh, this type of behavior, and we'll see, or I'll hopefully I'll prove to you, that when we really go down to the few atom or the small uh, channel type of, type of device, then things be behave in a very different way. Okay, as I said, uh, it's not only current flowing, but we can think about uh, other types of, of devices where electronic transport is important. For example, you, if we include uh, spin as, as a degree of freedom, for instance, uh, in uh, the read heads of hard drives, which uh, use an idea that was put forward in 1980s, 1988, which is giant magnetic resistance. So if you're thinking about uh, you know, using a read head for, for a, a hard drive, then you want to make this read head as small as possible because you want to store information in your hard drive in a small grain of magnetic material. Um, what you need to do then is to have something that is extremely sensitive to the magnetic orientation of your, of your grain. So uh, this has to be very small and at the same time have a very large response to this magnetic, uh, magnetic orientation. Uh, and this is the basic idea of giant magnetic resistance, the idea that depending on the orientation of this, uh, this grain that you're trying to read, it would influence the magnetic properties of your read head and then it will change the electronic properties or the electronic current that is flowing through this device. Um, então, obviously, there is some, some, some things that we need to understand in this, in this case, and uh, this is something that we also need to, to address. Um, another area where uh, this is also quite important is in the area of, of sensors. So, in order to detect something, like say for a gas, for example, then there are various ways of, of doing detection. Uh, you can use optical measurements, you can use um, um, capacitance measurements, or you can use an electronic measurement. So you can use current flowing through a particular system, and the, uh, the basic idea is that if you want to detect, whenever this thing that you want to detect is closed or connected to your device, then the electronic properties will change, so the current flowing through your device is going to change. Right? So, and this is particularly interesting, for example, for uh, biological applications, so um, when we think about nanoscopic systems, we can uh, think about biological systems where a biomolecule is typically nanoscopic in size. So if we're going down and shrinking our devices, then we're talking, saying that our devices have more or less the same size as a biological structure. And if we want to really go down to detecting biological structures at a single molecule level, and uh, detection is really associated with changes to a surface, then we're talking about surfaces that are the same size as the biological system. So this is, this is quite uh, the, the, the type of things that you can think of when you go and shrink your, your devices. You're not only talking about um, you know, making uh, transistors which are ever smaller, you can really think about new types of, of devices where you, know, you can detect uh, uh, molecules which are at the really the single level of detection, single molecule level of detection. Okay, so everything that I talked to you about up to now it has really one a common ingredient. And this common ingredient is that you have somehow a, a device, something, where current is flowing, so electrons are flowing through this device, and uh, somehow I want to measure what is happening uh, as the electrons flow through this, uh, this device? And everything is nanoscopic. Right? So this is, this is really uh, the, the starting point for, for what we want to talk uh, here in these in this three, three hours of, of, of chatting we're going to have. Okay, so how do we do this? I mean, the idea is how do we model or how do we understand uh, current flowing through, through a nanoscopic device? So let's first go really back in time and think about the first, uh, first few uh, ideas, or the very first idea of how electrons flow uh, through a material. And this was put forward by Drude right after the electron was, uh, was invented, or was discovered, uh, as, a, as a particle. And the whole idea that was put forward by Drude was that, okay, so you have this particle, the electron, it is... Um, somehow in, in the material, it can flow inside this material, 
And the electrons flowing are scattered by something. In this case, he thought the electrons were, were scattered by the, by the nuclei. And you can think of a very uh, simple electrostatic or electrodynamic picture where electrons are flowing, and then at some point they're scattered by these uh, scattering centers. They change their direction, and then they uh, flow in another direction, and then they are scattered again, and so on and so forth. And they're scattered a number of times. So you have a, a few ingredients to understand. There is a probability of being scattered, uh, which is given by some quantity here, which is related to the material you have. So it's this, uh, this uh, scattering time. Uh, you have a probability the electron will not be scattered. So it obviously is given by 1 minus this, uh, this quantity here. Uh, and then you apply a force, because without any force, the electrons will actually not flow. And this is the idea that, OK, so if you take a material and you're not applying an electric field, then there's no current flowing through this material. And obviously, this will change the momentum of your particle. So uh, essentially, this is, this is uh, Newton's, Newton's second law. Um, and then you construct a, a, an equation that will give you the change in momentum uh, that is going to occur because of, of, this, uh, of this force, including the effect of the scattering. Right? So you change the momentum because of the scattering. So you have a, a, an equation which has a driving force and also some uh, change because of this, of this scattering effect. Okay, so this is a, a differential equation. You can solve this problem. And in actual fact, what you get is if you apply a constant electric field, uh, you can write an equation for the, uh, the momentum that will have a transient uh, uh, part here. And it's going to give you, at some point, at some time t going to infinity, it's going to give you some uh, change in momentum that is proportional to the electric field. Okay, this is, this is essentially Ohm's law, right? So you get a current that is uh, some uh, quantity here that is associated with the material, is associated with the electron, uh, um, electron charge, the electron mass, right? It's, it's inertia, and the number of electrons available in a particular material. So say, for example, if you have gold, then you have a density of particles. If you have uh, something else, then the density is different, and so on and so forth. And this quantity that relates the current density in the electric field, or if you like, the current and the voltage, uh, is the conductivity. Right? And this is known as Drude's conductivity. Um, Drude, at this point, did not include any quantum mechanical effects. Um, you can include uh, quantum mechanical effects if you go to, for example, Sommerfeld's model. Uh, the form, interestingly, the form is the same. If you go to theories which are more complicated but still including uh, some, somehow this uh, scattering time. Uh, for example, if you go to, um, to, to Boltzmann theory, for example, with a constant scattering time, then you get roughly the same, the same result. So if you have lots of scattering, which is what we're having here, so we're so assuming that you know, our particle is scattering so many times that the, the, the problem becomes essentially diffusive, then this is the type of equation that we have. And this is what we would say that we have in a classical picture. Right? So we can include a quantum mechanical effects, but essentially uh, the, the picture is somehow s classical or semi-classical. Right? But we need a lot of scattering. And although we need scattering to, we want to have scattering, um, we want to have significantly less scattering that we really reach this uh, diffusive regime. So let's say that we have something that is very, very nanoscopic in the sense that the scattering length or the scattering time is actually comparable or even uh, the scattering length is smaller, is larger than the size of our device. Then basically what we're saying is that the, 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 the problem we're trying to deal with uh, does not really um, encompass this idea that you have multiple scatterings or at least not a significant number of scattering uh, 
uh, steps. Right? So we, we need to devise a somewhat different theory to understand what's happening really at this nanoscopic level uh, of, of, of electronic transfer. Okay, so let's try to do this. Right? Let's try to build a mesoscopic or nanoscopic uh, electronic theory. And so what are the ingredients that we require? So if we think of this problem in, in kind of th three different ways, uh, we have a problem where we have uh, an electromagnetic problem where we apply a bias. We're applying a bias through a, a system that is nanoscopic, but we need to know what is the potential profile of this, uh, of this problem. We also have a problem which is quantum mechanical in the sense that we need to treat parts of this problem, or at least all of the problem, uh, quantum mechanically. And so this means that we need to describe everything in terms of Hamiltonians and try to determine the, uh, the, these properties in terms of, of the uh, electronic states of, of the problem. And we also have a statistical mechanical problem uh, in the sense that we need to, uh, if we were in an equilibrium situation, then we would have a chemical potential. Now, here what we're doing is we're applying a bias, so our system is inherently out of equilibrium. And so uh, we need to understand what happens when we drive a system out of equilibrium, in particular, when we drive a system out of equilibrium, but we're looking for the steady state solution. So we're looking for a solution at uh, time t going to infinity. And so how do, we, how do we satisfy all these conditions and how do we understand what's happening in a situation like this uh, is really what we're going to talk about. Okay, so let's go for a pictorial view first. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, for the, this first uh, lecture, we're going to do everything in a kind of very... Uh, hand-waving, a little bit of quantitative uh, uh, way. So, so let's say this. So what is my problem? My problem is the following. I have a system, a very simple one. Uh, it's a molecule that I'm going to represent by a single uh, energy level. So what describes this molecule is its uh, energy and the occupation of this particular energy site. Um, then I'll attach this molecule to electrodes because in order to apply a bias, then I'll need to have uh, contacts to this molecule. So I want to see the flowing of electrons through this, through this device. I'll attach these electrodes. My electrodes are going to be very, very simple. So in this case, what I'll have is just simply a very good metal uh, which is filled up to some uh, chemical potential. So it's in, in thermal equilibrium. So it, it is described by a chemical potential. It has no structure in the sense that I have an infinite number of levels, all of them are occupied. Um, then obviously above these, all of these levels are empty. And this is true for the chemical potential of my left electrode. And this is true for uh, my system on the right. right? So everything is, is nice. Uh, nice and, and kind of featureless in the electrodes to begin with. Okay, so this is my uh, spherical chicken. Okay, now I'll apply a bias. So what I do when I apply a bias is basically I'll drive my system out of equilibrium and by driving my system out of equilibrium what I'm doing is I'm taking my chemical potential on the left and driving it up and taking my chemical potential on the right and driving it down. So if I apply a bias of V over 2, then here what I'm going to consider is that I'm grounding the, uh, the central uh, molecule and I'm driving the chemical potential on the, on the right by V over 2 and the, the chemical potential on the left by V over 2. I could be grounding my right electrode and driving the other one by V, of v uh, on this direction. Obviously then the system here would need to be corrected as well. So I'm actually fixing the system in the middle and, and uh, rearranging everything uh, on the around, this, around this system. Now, okay, so what I need to do is to understand what happens to electronic flow uh, in, this, in this particular uh, arrangement. Okay, so I just redrew here in a slightly different way. 
So I have different uh, bias. Uh, my bias window then is this uh, gray area here, right? So it's the area between the left chemical potential and the right chemical potential. And I would like to know, okay, so where is, uh, where are electrons flowing from the left to the right? And I know that electrons are going to flow from the left to the right. I'll, we'll get to uh, that conclusion in a second, but we can know that because I can think that what the system is, would like to do would be to go back to equilibrium. And in order for it to go back to equilibrium, then electrons that are at higher in energy would like to flow to s regions of, of uh, our energy levels which are lower in energy. So obviously I would like to remove electrons from this area here and put them down here. So this is, this is one way of, of seeing this problem. So the system is, although I'm applying this bias constantly, uh, I, I, I can imagine that what I'm doing is I'm, my electrons which are higher in energy would like to go back to the, the situation where they're lower in energy. Um, okay, so I can imagine this the following. So what would happen to this region which is above the chemical potential on the left? Well, I can conclude that this region has no contribution to the electronic transport because there are no electrons that are able to go from this position here to this position here because either side has no electrons in it. So there are no levels which could be filled to uh, contribute to the, to the electronic problem. So this region here is, does not have any contribution to the, to the electronic transport. I am, I am at somewhat a, a small temperature that this region, if, if I am at slightly higher temperature and assume that these guys are in a in a, um, these guys are in, in thermal equilibrium, and I'm assuming that I have a uh, perfectly um, elastic scattering. So we'll, we'll include inelastic scattering in a, in a second. So the question is, you're assuming because of phonons and, and things like that, that's, that's your question, is it? You're assuming that... Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so... I'll, we we'll introduce this nuance now. Then uh, it, it's it's uh, there will be a distribution, obviously, which is going to be included by the fact that we have a slightly higher temperature than zero, and so um, there will be a tail here which has some contribution, um, obviously, because we're not going to distribute to calculate this. Everything is filled up to mu l, but you have a Fermi distribution. So the system is still in equilibrium but at, at temp temperature is different from zero, then we have a Fermi distribution for, for this, uh, these electrodes. So there will be some uh, occupation here, but obviously this occupation becomes exponentially small, and then obviously as you go further and further away from the chemical potential, then this contribution is going to be exponentially uh, small. So in our pictorial view, we can think that we are very cl close or very close to, to uh, to t equal to zero, uh, and so this picture still holds, but even at temperatures which are higher than zero, if we move away from uh, anything uh, of above a few kT, then uh, the idea still holds. Okay, so the same picture can be said about, um, about the, these states here. So in this region, uh, we're still uh, having no current, and the reason for that is because now we have electrons available. However, uh, Pauli principle prevents us from having any current, essentially because you could, in principle, remove electrons from here, but they could not go to this site because they are uh, occupied already. So unless there is some form of scattering which gives energy to the electrons, for example, by, by phonons, then you could give energy to these electrons so that they would move to a, to a region where there are empty states. But in our very simple picture of, of, of scattering uh, or of, of electronic transport, uh, electrons cannot really flow from this region uh, to this region, just simply by poly, poly exclusion. Okay, so this would leave us with this very uh, narrow or somewhat narrow uh, region between the chemical potential on the left and the chemical potential on the right. Okay, so in this design that we did here, uh, 
you would still have no uh, electronic transport. And the reason for that is because we assume here that there is no direct connection between this electrode and this electrode. So they, they need to be coupled via this, uh, this molecule, right? this energy site. And this energy site is higher in energy, so it's outside the, the bias window. Again, this is very pictorial because whenever we actually couple this site to uh, the electrodes, there will be a broadening of this, uh, of this energy level. But here, what we can think of is that there, is, there will be no contribution to the current in this configuration because electrons are not, you have electrons available, you have empty sites available uh, for the electrons, but there's no current flowing because there is no coupling in this energy region to a central, uh, central molecule. Okay, so there, there should be no, no, no current or very little current flowing. So the only configuration where current will flow is the moment that we apply a bias that is large enough to encompass this energy wind, this, this energy level. And so this is the situation we're looking for. So basically what we can think of is that the configuration we need to do to have, to, uh, have current flowing is we need to apply bias because with no bias there's no current. The region that contributes to the bias, to the current, is bound by these uh, two chemical potentials, the left and the right chemical potentials. Um, we need to couple to this region in the middle, this molecule. Right? So we need to have levels uh, contributing to, the, to this uh, within the bias window. And obviously they need to be coupled to this, uh, to this uh, level. Okay? And then, in principle, we can have transport. Okay, so this is the idea. Let's put a, a few numbers or a few, uh, be a little bit more quantitative to, to our problem. Right? So we, we take our system, we couple it, and the basic idea of, of doing coupling is I create a constant in this case, uh, so it has no features again, so it has no energy dependence. And I couple it to the central scattering region, so it, uh, it, there is a coupling that uh, couples my molecule to the left and a coupling that mo couples my, my molecule to the right. I can see this coupling as um, an inverse time. So essentially what I can see is that this would be the inverse of the lifetime of the electron uh, going from the molecule to the right electrode or to the le left electrode or vice versa. So going from the, the, the electrode to the molecule and from the, the right electrode to the, to the molecule, right? So this would be um, how quickly or how easily it is for, if I put an electron here, for this electron to hop out either to the left or to the right. Okay, okay now I apply a bias. So basically what I'm doing is I drive my system out of equilibrium. I keep these, uh, these quantities the same. So they're, they're featureless again. They're the same, independent of bias. Okay, so how do I solve now this problem? Right? I can think of, of, of solving this problem in the following way. Let's say I initially decouple my right electrode. Right? So I decouple my right electrode and my system now is a single site coupled to the left electrode. And my, my problem now is the following. I, I created the situation and I want to find a situation where the system goes to a steady state. Now the steady state in this case would be equilibrium itself, right? Because there is no more chemical potential different from the chemical potential left or the, of the left, right? So there's nothing that is keeps driving my system out of equilibrium. So what I'm trying to do now is trying to find out what is the, uh, the equilibrium situation that my system would have uh, if, I, if I only couple my molecule to the left-hand side. Uh, so basically, in this case here, as I apply the bias, the electrons will flow into the molecule or into my, my side. And I can think of, of the, uh, the opposite problem, which is I take my system and then I uh, only couple it to the right-hand side. Now, because this uh, side here now is above the chemical potential on the right, 
then electrons would actually want to flow out of the molecule and into the chemical potential on the right. And also go towards equilibrium. And obviously what I want to do is try to find out this, this situation. Okay, so in equilibrium, so when I reach uh, equilibrium, what I would have is that the occupation of the site, if I only couple it to either the left or the right, will be given by uh, the um, Fermi distribution of the electrode. Because while my molecule has only one site, the electrons has essentially an infinite number of electrons available. So if it gives out an electron to the, to the, uh, to the site here, it doesn't really change anything to its uh, electronic properties. So in equilibrium, my occupation on this site would be given just simply by the chemical potential or the Fermi distribution of the either the left or the right-hand side. Now, out of equilibrium, what I want to do is to calculate what would be this occupation. And this occupation is actually changing as a function of time, right? Because I switched on this, uh, this coupling. It had an occupation at the beginning. And then uh, as I start to try to find equilibrium, this occupation is changing. Now, obviously, what is the occupation is changing in such a way that the current flowing from the left-hand side to the molecule, for example, if I only look at the right left-hand side, is given by uh, how easily it is for the electrons to flow in and out of the molecule. And, well, the difference in occupation between what it would like to have in equilibrium and what it has at the, uh, any given time. Right? So, essentially, what I'm saying is that as I... If I'm very far away from equilibrium, a lot of f electrons will flow in. Then as I start to reach equilibrium, obviously, uh, this difference will d decrease, and obviously the current will decrease until, obviously, the current is zero whenever I reach equilibrium. Right. And this is the same for the right-hand side. Now, on the right-hand side, electrons will want to flow out of the, out of the molecule, so the, uh, the current is, the sign of the, of the, the equation is changed. What I want to do is actually to write something that will give me the steady state. So what I'm doing is that I'm going to keep the system out of equilibrium uh, all the time. So when I reach the steady state, what I'm saying is that everything that goes into the molecule will come out. Right? So the current that is uh, flowing from the left into the molecule and the current that is flowing to the right from the molecule is the same. And so it's very simple. You can just do the maths there and substitute everything. You can, it's, um, so you have two equations, one for the current, one for the occupation. So you can get a, a, a solution for the occupation, and you can get a solution for the current flowing at steady state. Now, okay, it might look a little bit complicated, but the, the key point here, right, uh, that, it, that, it, that the take-home message up to now is the following. So, if you look at this equation here for the occupation of this problem, is it looks a lot like a weighted average. So we have a average, so we have the occupation that the system would have if it were only coupled to the left. We have the occupation that it would have if it were only coupled to the right. And we have, you know, how easily it is for electrons to go in and out of this uh, site. So it, the weighting is the, exactly how it is it is for the electrons to flow from the left to the molecule and the right to the molecule. Uh, if the occupations are identical, then the occupation in the middle of the molecule is one. Right? So this is, this is the uh, take-home message for the occupation in, this, in, this, in the middle side. Okay, what about the current? Well, the current, again, depends. So the maximum of the current depends on this uh, quantity, so it depends again how easily it is for electrons to flow in and out of the molecule. And it includes exactly this idea that uh, we were, I was trying to show you pictorically, right? So the current flowing is bound by the two chemical potentials. So at zero temperature is essentially, uh, it's, uh, there is only current flowing if you are within the bias window, right? If you have a uh, temperature which is slightly different than zero, then you have some contribution which is coming from the tail of the Fermi distribution. Right. But uh, 
But essentially, this is it. Right? So you have occupation, which is uh, some, somehow a weighted average, and current, which is bound by, by, this, uh, by this region and gives an important contribution, which is obviously giving, given by how easily it is for electrons to flow in and out of the molecule. So how does uh, an IV curve look in this case? Well, exactly as uh, basically what I did here was to write down those, those two equations and, and, and solve them. And so as you apply a bias, I start applying a bias, there's no current. I apply a positive bias here, but negative bias would be exactly the same. So that equation has no, uh, the, the system is completely symmetrical, even though uh, I can choose to have uh, couplings which are different from the left and the right. I apply a bias, and if I start ramping up the bias, there will be no current flowing until this guy here, so there is an energy window, there are states here available, but there's no, uh, there's no molecule in the middle. So there's no current. Whenever the molecule or the energy uh, window reaches the energy of the molecule, then I start to have this current flowing. And immediately, the moment you, this guy enters the energy window, then the current shoots up, right? So the, the slope of this, uh, this line, or approximate line, is going to be given only by the temperature, right? So in, in this case. So the current almost immediately uh, goes, ramps up and gets to the, uh, the maximum of current. Um, I, what I could do is I could include more uh, sites, more energy levels within my molecule, and everything that would happen would be just uh, including more available channels for this electron to flow. So whenever a channel or whenever a site comes into the energy window, then I would give a contribution to the current which is coming from that particular, uh, from that particular channel. Okay. Uh, I can include one more ingredient into this problem, and, uh, which is to solve the problem including uh, some form of electronic interactions. And so in a very simple, oops, sorry. So in a very simple pictorial view, let's say now what I'm doing is I had my, my molecule, which had its electronic configuration, typically uh, neutral, charge neutral. And then I couple to the electrodes. And again, um, when I couple this, this system to the electrons, typically the problem would like to be still neutral. So the, the the entire system finds equilibrium and ha still has uh, a fixed number of, of, of electrons. And whenever you count the electrons plus the, the, uh, the core, then you get zero. But then when you apply a bias, what might happen is you start to charge this molecule. Right? You can either remove electrons. As we, s as we saw, I mean, the, the, uh, the average occupation of that site changes as we apply a bias. Right? So what might happen is that, well, you have a molecule that like to be charged neutral. You try to put an extra electron or remove an electron from that molecule, and obviously uh, it will change its, its properties. At the extreme case, you can think of a molecule that is very weakly coupled, and you introduce this, uh, this, single, si this uh, sin single energy level, and then you start to have effects which are uh, many body effects, for example, uh, you have condo, or you have um, you have uh, Coulomb blockade, and and things which we'll we'll get to. Right? So so this is an important uh, important thing that should be included in our in our description, and up to this point, it's not. So how do we how do we include this in a very very simple way? Is do it in a oops, sorry, do it in a in a I include in my energy level some correction which depends on the occupation of the molecule at a certain bias. Right? I can do this in many different, in many different degrees of, of complication. What I'm going to do here is a very simple mean field approach. So basically what I'm doing is if I try to put some fraction of charge into my, my site, then uh, 
the energy level will go up or down by some uh, number u, right? Which so depends on on the occupation of my of my system. Uh, okay, so if I do this now, what happens is that my occupation depends on the occupation itself. So everything needs to be calculated self-consistently. Things are still relatively simple. It's just that I need to do this equation here now in a self-consistent way because the energy depends on the occupation. The occupation depends, obviously, on the energy in terms of the, of the Fermi distributions. But this can be done. It's simple to do. And what happens when I, when I uh, include this effect? Well, first of all, what we see is that before we had at zero temperature, for example, the current would just jump up to its, uh, to its maximum whenever I, uh, whenever I reach that BIOS window. Now, whenever the molecule now enters the BIOS window, what happens is that I start to apply, apply my BIOS. Electrons now will want to flow into the molecule, but because the molecule likes to be charge neutral, so there is this term U, that uh, increases the energy if I try to charge my molecule, the energy level will also move up, right? It will move up up to some energy U. Um, so whenever, so up to a point where now I've, I've, I've reached the point where it can only go up by, by U, so whenever I apply a bias that is bigger than this energy, this charging energy, then I start to, f to get to, to a point where this energy cannot really go up anymore, and though I reach my saturation point. So what happens to my, my current is that now it had that uh, flat region where the, there's no site in the, in the bias window. Then I have a region here, which is a charging region, where the, uh, the site is being charged. So the char site is moving more or less with together with the with the with the bias window, and then obviously whenever I cannot really charge this mo this site anymore, so you can act really put an electron in there, then uh, the the system is completely uh, filled. Okay, now the problem is that well, or the interesting thing is that not only we have this ramp, but now we can actually get some other features into into our system. For example, if my uh, my couplings are different. So if my coupling from the left and the coupling from the right are, are, are different, then I can get a symmetric curve. So depending on the coupling, I can get, you know, it's easier to charge than to discharge the molecule. So the slope of this uh, system going up for positive bias is different than the slope for the, the negative bias. So I can get asymmetric uh, IV characteristics if I include this, uh, this effect. Okay. Uh, so, we have a picture of electronic transport, which is essentially a rate equation. So we have, you know, we're, we're calculating how many electrons are going into my system. We calculate how many electrons are flowing out of the system. We, ca we, we impose a steady state, so we need uh, everything to be balanced. And then we find a description of transport that is, seems uh, to make sense. Obviously, this is a very simple picture. There are a lot more ingredients that we could put in. So we could put in more electron-electron interactions. We could you know, include inelastic effects. But we'll stop here. Right. And I'll try to give you another picture of transport. One picture that uh, is somewhat more quantum mechanical in the sense that we're really going to start from a tight binding model and then uh, work our way towards uh, a picture of electronic transport in terms not only not in terms of of this uh, flow of electrons but in terms of a, of a quantity that I'll call transmission. Okay, so let's take our our, our this new approach. So let's say I have a chain of atoms, and a, again, still keeping the very simple simple approach, we have a chain of atoms which is formed by a single site, so we have only one energy level describing this, thing, this, uh, this, this site. We have a coupling between this, uh, this, energy, this energy level, and our system is completely perfect. Right? So it's a, it's a chain of atoms that is absolutely perfect. We can write a Hamiltonian for, for this problem. 
uh, we're going to use a tight binding Hamiltonian, which is only including uh, first nearest neighbor coupling. So it's extremely simple. Our um, Hamiltonian, our, our basis is, is orthogonal. So everything here can be generalized, but let's, let's keep it as simple as possible. Okay, so I have a Hamiltonian. I know how to solve this problem for, for uh, the infinite chain. Uh, so it's a, it's a the solution is a block state. Uh, we get a very nice uh, description of the dispersion, which is a, which is a cosine. Um, I can impose boundary conditions. Um, so if my chain is finite, then I get uh, uh, the, the quantum number is m. If it's infinite, then it's a, it's a continuous variable. We, uh, we call it k, the, the crystal momentum. Um, so, so we have a wave function to describe this problem. Right? So it's, it's periodic, so it's, it's uh, easy enough. Okay, um, so what we can do is we can use the continuity equation to calculate the current. Um, so if we think of a, of, of, a, of a classical approach, then we would have the charge density. Uh, here we're going to use the density matrix. So we have only one, one uh, well per k, per k quantum number, we have only one, uh, one, uh, one state. And then I can calculate the, uh, the, deriv the time derivative of, of, the, of, the, of this density matrix simply by using uh, uh, Heisenberg. Okay, so this is what we can do for this, for this very simple problem. Uh, and I can calculate the current at one particular site in this problem. So I'll project the current uh, onto a particular uh, site. And if I, if I do all the calculations, what I'll see is that there will be a contribution to this current, which is a contribution of uh, particles flowing from site J plus 1 to site J. So it's particles that are flowing from this region or this region into the, the central site and from this region into the central site. And it looks kind of... Um, kind of a uh, kind of a big dragon here, but all, all we're talking about here is that we have you know the 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 coefficients of the wave function on j and j plus one, and then we project onto the onto the Hamiltonian, uh, and what we get here is that the contribution to the current flowing from uh, the left into the site is equal and opposite to the contribution to the current from flowing from the right to the to the left. Uh, Obviously, is then if we calculate the current flowing, the current is zero. Now, okay, this might seem like a bad thing, but it's a good thing because we didn't apply bias. So there's no current flowing because obviously what we have here is that we're assuming that electrons are flowing from the left and uh, from the right. Obviously, they cancel out and the, the total current is zero. Now, I would like to go and calculate somehow this current and or at least take a, a pictorial view of, of current or uh, electrons flowing, but at the same time I would like to go to the very very case where the V tends to be zero. So what I'm going to do is to break the symmetry. So what I'm going to say is that, okay, so what I could do is I could think of the problem as having a bias already applied, I have a current, and then I drive the system back to equilibrium by taking the system back to V equal to zero. And so, because I already chose the direction the electrons are coming from, because I applied a bias before, then basically the contribution is coming from that direction. So I essentially choose where the electrons are coming from. And this is basically what we're doing, for example, in a quantum mechanics problem where we take a scattering uh, a square potential, problem that you do in, in, uh, in undergraduate quantum mechanics. You take a square potential and you say, oh, electrons are coming from the left. So I write an equation for the electron coming from the left. The electron then is uh, scattered by this, by this square potential. So there's a probability the electron will be uh, scattered back and a probability that will be transmitted. So I'm solving this problem by choosing 
from which directions their electrons are coming from. And this is what I'm going to do here as well. So I choose the direction of the, uh, of the incoming electrons, so I have only a contribution to the current uh, from the left. I can calculate uh, the uh, velocity operator of, this, of these electrons, which is essentially the derivative of the energy with respect to the crystal momentum. So uh, what I can see is that this current is basically the velocity divided by, by uh, L, which is the size of my system. Um, okay, why did I do this? Uh, okay, so if I do the same for a, I, so I write the, the velocity in this in the sense, but I also calculate the density of states, which is the derivative of the occupation with respect to energy, and I get another uh, another equation, and then I see that the density of states has also a dependence, or I can rewrite everything, and it has also a dependence on the on the velocity. So when I when I try to calculate the current, which depends on the velocity of the electrons uh, and on this density. So if we go back to that picture by, by, by Drude, right, where we're calculating now what is the, uh, the effective current that is flowing depending on the number of electrons that are available for this, uh, for this current to flow. Then what I find is that uh, I do an integral again over the chemical potential, sorry, here is from the chemical potential on the left, uh, the right to the left, and I integrate this number. What I find is as at, at the limit of t going to zero, I get something like this. I get two e squared over h times delta v, right? So which is the bias that is applied. Okay, now um, this is quite interesting because everything that I did was I started from this Hamiltonian, and I got to a point where I get the current, which is only a quantity that depends on uh, fundamental quantities, right? So it depends on E and it depends on H, right? It does not depend on the on-site energy that I devised. It does not depend on the coupling, the bet beta. So it seems to be a quantity that is uh, universal. Right. Okay, uh, and this quantity here we call the quantum of conductance. In fact, if we have uh, a system which is truly one-dimensional, which is really what the case that we, we had there, uh, this is going to be the case. Uh, so um, we are saying that the conductance of a system like that is quantized in terms of this uh, uh, quantum of conductance. Um, okay, what happens if we have uh, many different channels? So again, if we have a system which is not only truly one-dimensional but has you know different different modes, then what we expect to see is exactly the same as I was saying before for that very simple model. Whenever a new mode comes in, uh, provided we don't close the previous one. So if we think about the bands in our system, whenever we access a new band, then we should see a jump in conductance that is given by this quantum of conductance. Right? So whenever we have a, a, a nice mode that is, that is conducting, then uh, we should see this step. Uh, in fact, um, there are experiments that show exactly that. For example, uh, this one here. Um, which is uh, uh, by the group in, in, uh, in Holland, uh, by uh, Van Rut uh, Rutenbach's uh, well, and their, their collaborator's experiment. And you see that the quantum of conductance goes up in uh, units here, right, as you apply a bias. So in their case, what they had was a system which is consisting of a two-dimensional electron gas so you have a, a gas of electrons in this, in this material here, this doped aluminum gallium arsenide uh, uh, semiconductor. You create a two-dimensional electron gas, and then you confine it to one dimension by uh, putting these two gates here, so the electrons must flow uh, over here. So you have one electrode on one side, the electrode on the other side, and the electrons are flowing. You form a channel, and then you change the number of channels by applying, uh, by changing this gate voltage here. So essentially what you're doing is you're 
making your constriction bigger or smaller so you allow for more states to be present or, or, or not in this, in this, in this system. Um, this can also be done in single uh, chains. So, for example, here, uh, the experiment by Daniel Gatti and, and Vale Rodriguez in, at Unicamp, they form a single atom chain, in this case, uh, gold. And what they do, so you can see a single atom chain forming in a transmission electron microscope. That's the chain there. And they can actually measure the current flowing through a device like this, so through a, a single atom chain. You can have chains with different, uh, of different shapes. So here, for example, you have a slightly uh, thicker um, structure. In this, this is silver. But so you can do for silver, you can do for platinum, you can do for gold. All these, uh, all these metals can, be, can, can form chains. And you can calculate, and you can measure the conductance. And for example, here, uh, this is the experiment by, by Takayanagi in, in Japan, where they can actually do this, the experiments at the same time. So you can see the wire forming and at the same time measure, uh, measure conductance. And you can clearly see that you see jumps in conductance, uh, which are quantized as you're evolving the chain. And while in the experiment with, uh, with the 2EG electron gas, what you're doing is you're making a constriction bigger or smaller with a, with a, uh, with a gate, here, uh, these changes here associated with uh, different numbers of atoms in your, in your channel. I'm finishing. Um, okay, so, so this is the more general case would be to actually include uh, a scatterer. So you see our system was very, very simple. And so in, our, in that case, there was no scattering. Even though there is a resistance or there is a, a, a quantum of conductance, there was no scattering site in the system, right? So there is an, in, an intrinsic... Uh, 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 conductance quantum, which is associated with the infinite system, right? So no, no, uh, no, no scatterer. But if we include a scatterer, then we reach a point where we associate the conductance, or how easily it is for electrons to flow through a device, with the probability uh, that the electrons will be scattered by some scattering center which is given by the transmission probability. And this transmission probability is nothing less or nothing more than uh, the same transmission probability that you have when you calculate uh, this step potential in a, in a quantum mechanical problem, right? So, uh, and this is known as, as Landauer theory. So within Landauer, uh, essentially what you want to calculate is this transmission probability, uh, which will give you information about, about your about your uh, conductance. Okay, so I'll stop here. And the question that will remain for the next uh, classes is, okay, are we done? And I would like to say yes, then I can go to the beach. But uh, the answer is no. We need to reconcile the two pictures. So we have a picture which is essentially uh, given by the evolution operator of the, of the density. And we have a picture where we had a rate equation. And we, I want to reconcile these two pictures. I also want to be able to include uh, more effects. So I want to include electron interactions, electron-electron interactions, electron-phonon interactions. Uh, and so all of this needs to be done. And so this is what I plan to do in the next two classes. Thank you.